Thanks, Patty. Good morning, everyone. I'll be changing the focus to some of the opportunities and challenges in adults with congenital heart disease. I'd like to thank the UACVI uh, for the opportunity to speak today. These are my disclosures. The adult with congenital heart disease, ACHD, is a hybrid field serving patients whose needs are not entirely met in classic pediatric or congenital cardiology and adult cardiology care models. In ACHD, the anatomy of the congenital cardiac defect and its structural palliation exists alongside pathology from hypertensive heart disease, degenerative valve disease, or regional ischemia. Cardiovascular imaging support in ACHD must navigate the intersection of congenital and acquired cardiovascular conditions. Like a pediatric Ecolab would, it must provide precise anatomic information and how surgery or catheter interventions would have modified it. Like an adult lab would, it must provide precise quantitation of cardiac function and pathophysiology. The North American Jackalope is a hybrid like the ideal ACHD Ecolab. It incorporates the features of both the antelope and the jackrabbit. And like the ideal ACHD Ecolab, it's often dreamt of but seldom seen. Our goal today is to hunt for that elusive creature, the ideal lab for ACHD. We'll begin by reviewing some of the attributes of the adult Ecolab, where the protocols are designed to quantify the changes and insults to which the adult heart is predisposed. Even when these are additive, as in the low flow, low gradient circumstances of aortic stenosis that is severe, the adult echo methodology capitalizes on strong quantitative techniques like the continuity equation. It's commonly misleading to assume normal ventricular function and to use peak and mean flow velocities for estimation of severity of stenosis. So estimation of the actual valve area is a standard approach. Adult protocols are not limited to apical views, but also include peristernal long and short axis images. And these standardized views are recorded in a consistent fashion to complete a full assessment of valves and myocardial function. Sonographers have a highly disciplined routine to optimize the images for measurement and to assure that the functional assessments and chamber volumetrics are accurate. Adult labs are prepared to use contrast injections that are often necessary for border detection. Strain mapping provides a means to detect segmental myocardial dysfunction commonly encountered in atherosclerotic heart disease. Patients with ACHD are not immune to this problem and they are more likely to be affected as they age. These are images of an ACHD patient who had ultrasound contrast infusion and you can see the improved visualization of the left ventricular endocardial border. Some other labs use contrast for myocardial perfusion imaging which can detect not only a suspected epicardial coronary issue, but also a supply-demand mismatch situation that is not uncommon in ACHD. The right panel here shows contrast imaging as stress, where you see delayed replenishment of the microbubbles in the myocardium, manifesting as extensive perfusion defects in the septum and apicolateral segments, indicating a left coronary issue. So in summary, for the patient in the adult lab, in terms of cardiac chambers and myocardium, the measurements can answer for us how large, how thick, and how vigorous, and for the valves, how leaky and how stenotic. We have well-established standards for nearly all things we measure in the adult echo lab, and compared to these standards, we can determine if there is a problem, and if so, how severe it is. This approach is broadly applicable for acquired heart disease in adults, but it relies on a big assumption. Quantification and grading methods in adult echo assume anatomic consistency. All the hearts, like all the rabbits, are built and oriented in much the same way. But that's not true for pediatrics. Performance of a pediatric echo incorporates an approach designed for applicability across a wide spectrum of anomalies encountered in congenital heart disease. It makes no assumptions about anatomic consistency and always begins by asking where each structure is in relation to everything else. Echo views, which would be unconventional in the adult echo lab, takes on added importance in this context. To illustrate, consider how the question of visceral situs is addressed. Many pediatric labs begins exam in the subcostal views as shown in the left for determination of the situs 
of the abdominal organs. In the adult lab, we might see an image like what you see on the right, displayed in keeping with conventions used in the adult exam. And a few labs might even use specific annotations to show the transducer positions and allow interpretation. Another point of confusion is how the pediatric image will display the inferior structures at the bottom of the screen and the superior structures at the top, whereas the reverse is true for apical images obtained in the adult lab. Having the image accurately reflect the cardiac structure within, this, within the chest is important when the emphasis is on definitive anatomic diagnosis, but is unimportant when the emphasis is on functional quantitation. Use of the sweep is another area in which the approach in the PEATS lab differs from the adult lab. For example, consider the image acquisition from the subcostal transducer position. The probe is not sitting still, but is swept across a set of planes. The long axis sweep is shown on the left and the short axis sweep on the right. And the same is true for parasternal, apical, and suprasternal images. It's important that the probe sweeps through these planes to define the spatial relationships within the heart, but in the structurally normal adult heart, sweeping the transducer serves only to disrupt the standard image acquisition. Pediatric echocardiographers even sweep through the structures in the right, high right peristernal position, as shown here. From the adult lab perspective, again, this consumes a lot of time that would be better spent acquiring images for functional quantitation. Indeed, acquisition of all these sweeps from all these transducer positions is some heavy lifting. This is published table showing the transducer positions and structures in a standard pediatric cardiac exam. And the long list is shown here just to emphasize how complex the task is. It's time consuming, it depends on a high degree of sonographer expertise, and often requires direct collaboration between the sonographer and the cardiologist. So, is it worth the effort? As we study these images, we learn a great deal about structural anatomy and segmental connections. We diagnose even the most complex and confusing defects like abnormal situs, congenitally corrected transposition, and also abnormal interventricular relationships like the upstairs-downstairs heart. We can evaluate specific structures that are likely to be abnormal, like the coronaries, the pulmonary veins, the branch pulmonary arteries, and the aortic arch. And we can also visualize surgically relevant anatomy that may have a bearing on how to best repair a specific variant of a double outlet right ventricle or how a Fontaine palliation can be constructed. Pediatric images must always remain alert to what we haven't learned from an echocardiogram is unanswered, then we must recognize the need to pursue definitive anatomic diagnosis with further tomographic imaging, MRI, or CT. So in summary, the pediatric approach is applicable across a wide spectrum of anomalies. It requires many transducer positions and image sweeps, and close collaboration between the cardiologist and sonographer is required in complex cases. Quantitative echo is a special challenge in PEATS because of the broad body size variability requiring measurements to be expressed relative to body size. So Z-score calculators like the one on the right have been developed to support this task. Granted, adult and PEATS echo approaches are different, but do they arrive at the same conclusions? Harmon et al. checked if applying the adult and pediatric guidelines resulted in concordant results on LV size in a large series of echoes in adults without congenital heart disease. There was agreement only in 41% of the males and just 9% of females. It appears we have an answer, and the answer is no. At this point, we may be wondering what it would take to serve the ACHD population by bridging the gap between the two approaches. So far, it appears we must reach consensus on what images are necessary, how they need to be acquired, how they need to be displayed, and the methodology for quantitation. But there are at least a couple of other considerations. First, when does the structural anatomy modify the needs for functional assessment? And second, how to address templated reporting? We'll briefly consider the problems reporting ventricular function in complex congenital hearts and the challenges of doing so under the constraints of a reporting template designed for structurally normal hearts. The trouble with templates in ACHD is akin to the classic square peg round hole problem. We find ourselves trying to fit the square peg of complex surgically modified congenital heart disease into the round peg of templated reporting designed around the structurally normal heart. The report format does not allow convenient reporting of critical anatomic findings and also 
functional data that we know doesn't make sense because of the peculiar anatomic configuration. I'll illustrate this with two examples, hyperplastic left heart syndrome and con congenitally corrected transposition of the great arteries. Increasingly, patients with a Fontaine palliation for single ventricles like hyperplastic left heart survive into adulthood and receive care in ACHD clinics. In this setting, the mitral and aortic valves are atritic or nearly so, and the left ventricle is extremely small. The result of a series of surgical palliations is that desaturated central venous blood will flow directly into the pulmonary arteries without an intervening ventricle, while pulmonary venous blood crosses the atrial septum into the right atrium, right ventricle, reconstructed ascending aorta and the aortic arch. Even though the integrity of the post-surgical anatomy, the novel flow patterns, and systemic ventricular function are important considerations, we would be hard-pressed to adapt an adult cardiology templ reporting template in echocardiography. We'll have more to say about meaningful reporting of ventricular function in my next example, congenitally corrected transposition. In CCTGA, the left atrium connects to the right ventricle, which connects to the aorta. The right atrium connects to the, to the left ventricle, which connects to the pulmonary artery. Left ventricle is on the right, and the right ventricle is on the left. So how do we write a report in this condition if the template is organized in the usual way displayed in the red box with the left heart and entry lines connecting to the mitral and aortic valves and the right heart asking about the tricuspid and pulmonary valves? Ventricular function assessment is complicated as well. Unlike a subpulmonary right ventricle, the systemic RV has a circumferential contraction pattern, and this peculiar anatomic characteristic renders established RV quantification techniques like TAPSI and systolic excursion velocity unhelpful. Here, the use of RV longitudinal strain and fr fractional area change, FAC, are more suitable. Of course, this problem is not unique to CCTGA. Atrial baffling procedures for the treatment of standard transposition detransposition also result in the systemic right ventricle. Effective ACHD imaging depends on a successful synergy. The International Society for Adult Congenital Heart Disease has proposed an imaging protocol that's elaborate and comprehensive, starts with subcostal views, includes many quantitative techniques, and it's a nice synthesis of many of the things we have been talking. Ultimately, a hybrid echo protocol is the ideal we aspire, but how we get there depends on where we are now. Some of us are based in pediatric facilities, others in adult hospitals. So let's take a look briefly at the road forward from each of these perspectives. For those of us working in a pediatric echo lab, we will need to learn how to tackle poor acoustic windows and to utilize quantification techniques. Facility with echo contrast and transesophageal echo and a lab culture that is quick to apply these tools will be required. Expertise with segmental wall motion analysis need to be developed. Quantitative methods like annular tissue Doppler and atrial volumetrics need to be routine and accurate. Similarly, quantitative methods to assess valve dysfunction will need to be incorporated. The scope of echo lab support will need to be broad and include adoption of technologies and protocols that support structural interventions, which we heard in the previous talk, which are increasingly performed in adult patients, specifically for the mitral, aortic, and tricuspid valve repairs and replacements. For those of us working in adult echo labs, we need to learn to tackle complex anatomy and surgical history, incorporate the anatomic sweep method, and standardize techniques for diagnosing anatomic complexities. Sonographers will need to be more comfortable applying anatomic classifications for congenital hearts and learn to show venous anatomy and segmental connections. Reporting templates must need to be flexible and should not compel us to describe a right heart that is not a classic right heart. And finally, we should think surgically, routinely measuring parameters of surgical importance like valve annular diameters and pulmonary arterial sizes. So what are our take home messages? The ACHD echo lab must effectively address both the acquired heart disease the adults get and the complex anatomic context in which this take place. We draw both from the adult lab model with its emphasis on precise functional quantitation and the pediatric lab model with its meticulous attention to anatomy. The result is a hybrid which is greater than the sum of its parts and relies on a high degree of cardiologist sonographer interaction and collaboration. In conclusion, a hybrid specialty as unique as ACHD deserves a hybrid lab to support it. 
We aspire to standardization, precision, and quantification while accommodating heterogeneous anatomy. I wanted to acknowledge my colleagues who helped with this talk, and thank you for attention. Thank you.